In this video, we're going to take a look at the physics of dropping a rock. Looking at our information, we're told a few things, and one of the things we're told is actually unnecessary. And it's important for you to, to be able to pick out information that's not appropriate to your problem because guaranteed you're going to come across problems where there's going to be a lot of extra information that has no value to solving the problem itself. This is particularly true in real life situations whenever you're conducting a lab. If I've seen it happen once, I've seen it happen dozens of times where students are given a particular task in the lab. It's very open-ended and the first thing they do is they jump out of their seats and they start making measurements. They set up their lab equipment and they make their measurements. Well, they finish their measurements, they break down their lab equipment, they sit down and they start analyzing their data. And one of the things that inevitably happens is that they collect the data on everything but that one piece of information that was most important. And it could be something simple like mass, for example, um, or maybe they forgot to you know, measure an angle, they forgot that was necessary. doesn't matter. The point is that there's a lot of extra information that you're exposed to when, when conducting a lab. And so you need to be focused on those things which are important for you. And the same is true going to is going to be true with problem solving. And in this case, we're told what the mass of the rock is. It's 550 grams. That's completely unnecessary. That's a one pound rock. We, we don't need to know that. So we can just cross out this information here. Okay, so what is important? The rock is on a cliff that's 16 meters high. The rock is dropped. That implies that the initial velocity is zero and also implies that the acceleration is 9.8 meters per second squared downward. So let's take a look at the first question, which is how fast is the rock moving when it strikes the ground at the bottom of the cliff? So here's a picture of our cliff and the rock starts here it's 16 meters from top to bottom and we want to know when the rock is down here what is V final remember that V final is never zero when the rock strikes the ground ever 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 so this is what we're looking for it's an unknown quantity all right, the first step is now accomplished. Well, actually, not quite. Um, we didn't write in here that the rock has an initial velocity of zero and the acceleration, because negative is in the down direction, it's a minus 9.8 meters per second squared. All right, so step one is done. Now we move on to step two, and we have to look at our equations. As you can see, we've got three equations as our starting point you have to decide which equation you want to use. It honestly does not matter which one you use. I think it's obvious that you should not use the position function because we're being asked what V final is. And the next least obvious choice would be the acceleration independent equation of motion because we don't know how long it takes for the rock to reach the ground. So that means we're going to start off with the time independent equation of motion. So we're going to have V final squared equals V initial squared plus 2AD. Now remember you don't want to do anything with minus signs yet. You just want to do the algebra. Okay now V initial we know is 0 so that's going to go away. And so we're left with V final is equal to the square root of 2 our acceleration is g times d. Now all we have to do is substitute our information. So we get v final is equal to the square root of 2 times a negative 9.8 times a negative 16. And let's see what v final is. Okay, so we're going to do the square root 
of 2. Now this negative and this negative cancel out, so we can just put everything into the calculator as positive. So that's going to be square root of 2 times 9.8 times 16. And that's going to give us 17.7 .7 meters per second. But that's not right. What's wrong with this answer? If you said that the velocity should be negative, you would be correct. So the next question is, how is it that you can make it negative? The calculator gave you a positive answer. All right, the answer to that question because a square root is plus or minus. You get two possible answers from a square root. It can be positive, it can be negative. So you have to be the one that assigns the negative value to V final. Okay, so let's take a look at the second question. And we want to know how long does it take for the rock to reach the bottom of the cliff? So for that, I forgot to do it in this first part of the question in part A. But let's go ahead and look, uh, list out our information for part B. We have D is equal to minus 16 meters. We have V initial is zero. V final um, earlier on was unknown. So I'm going to leave that as a box, as an unknown quantity. I'll explain why here in a minute. We have the acceleration is minus 9.8 meters per second squared. And then we have time, which is also another unknown quantity. Okay, so now we've got to select an equation, which is going to give us the amount of time it takes to reach the bottom of the cliff. And looking at our equations, you can see that the uh, position function and the acceleration independent equation of motion are both really good for giving us time. Um, and indeed, we will use uh, the position function. Now, why would there be a preference for the position function over the acceleration independent equation of motion or the time independent equation of motion? Let's start from the bottom and go up. For the time independent equation of motion, there is no time in the equation. So, it's not directly uh, applicable to our particular problem. Not that we couldn't include time by substituting from one of our definitions, it's just that it's not in there and so it really doesn't make a lot of sense to start with that equation. The reason that this um, acceleration independent equation of motion isn't really the best idea, it definitely works, but it's not the best idea because the final velocity was something that you had to calculate. And as a result, that piece of information is less reliable than the information which was given. So if you're going to have your most um, reliable results, you would want to try to find an equation that uses only the information which was given to you. Now, if you decided that you wanted to use the acceleration independent equation, go for it. It's not wrong. It just means that other parts of the problem, if there are other parts of the problem that depend on um, that question, you might find that you get other parts of the problem wrong, not because your algebra and logic was wrong, but because you punched the wrong numbers into your calculator and you got the wrong answer. So it just helps to avoid errors as the result of um, other mistakes. Okay, so for this one we're going to use the position function and we have d is equal to v initial t plus one half a t squared and we know that v initial was zero and now solving for t we get t is equal to the square root of 2d over a or the square root of 2 times um, a minus 16 meters divided by minus 9.8 meters per second squared. 
So T is going to be equal to two times a minus 16 divided by a minus 9.8. And we get 1.81 seconds. Finally, let's take a look at part C. So what we're going to do is we're just going to figure out what is delta T1, the time to go from the top of the cliff down to minus 8 meters. And then we're going to have delta T2, which is the time to go from minus 8 meters to minus 16 meters. Now there's a couple ways of doing this. Um, and this is going to be the, the first way that we do it. And then there's another one that we could just use um, really just a little bit of logic. Uh, but we could still show it mathematically, and that would also be sufficient uh, to answer the question, to justify our response. So there's two, at least two possible justifications. So first, let's calculate how long it takes for it to fall the first 8 meters. So for that, we're going to go back to our equation sheet, and we're going to ask ourselves, of these equations, which one would I use to determine the amount of time it takes to fall 8 meters? And just like before, our reasoning is going to be the position function is the best because we don't know what V final is. And even though we can calculate it, it just introduces the possibility that we make another mistake. So trying to stick with only the information we have, um, we're going to use, with the, use the position function. So that's going to be D is equal to V initial T plus one half at squared and we know that v initial was zero so we're going to call this t1 that represents delta t1 uh, so t1 is equal to 2d over the square root of 2d over g so that's the square root of 2 times 8 divided by 9.8 Remember that 8 had a negative on it, and the 9.8 had a negative on it, and those two negatives canceled out. So T1 is going to be equal to the square root of 16 divided by 9.8, and that's going to be 1.27 seconds. Okay, so you can see very clearly that the time to fall the first 8 meters is 1.27 seconds, and it only takes approximately 0.5 to 0.6 seconds to fall the last 8 meters. So delta T1 is 1.27, and we get that by doing this. Delta T1 is equal to T1 minus T0, and T0 was 0, so that's just going to be our 1.27 seconds. And then delta T2 is going to be the last time, which we'll call T2, minus the time to go to 8 meters, because that's where this time interval starts, was 1.27, so we'll call that T1. So 1.81 minus 1.27. And that's going to be equal to 0.54 seconds. All right, so we have justified our response because we have shown that delta T1 and delta T2 um, are significantly different, where T2 is much less than T1.